In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Now is the time to wake from sleep, says St. Paul to us this morning. Our salvation is near. The day is at hand. Cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light, and let us walk as in the day. Reading this on Cheese Fair Sunday, we know that the church means for us to take the day that St. Paul speaks of as the day of Great Lent. And from our reading in the prophet Joel at last Wednesday Vespers, we are given to know that St. Paul's day that is at hand is the day of the Lord that is near in the Valley of Judgment, where the Lord sits to judge all the nations, as Joel says. This day is not a 24-hour day, nor is it just the first day of Great Lent. It's the full 50 days of Great Lent, Holy Week, and Pascha. Or rather, it is the day of the Lord that we are about to enter mystically in the invisible church of the heart. For we read from Saint, we read from St. Luke on Thursday last that when the Lord was crucified, the sun was darkened. As the prophet Joel said it would happen on the day of the Lord. So from the church lectionary, we are given to know that the day on which Christ was crucified is the last day. It's the day of the Lord. It's the day of judgment. All the Gospels say that the sun was darkened on that day. That means theologically that this was the day that the world came to an end in its invisible spiritual root. For the sun, moon, and stars ceased to rule the day and night or the seasons. In its invisible spiritual root, as it was at the beginning, the world now moves not in the 24-hour days of the sun. And remember that the sun and the moon and the stars were not created until the fourth day. So as at the beginning, the world no longer does not move anymore in the 24-hour days of the sun. But rather, the world now moves in its spiritual root in the uncreated light of God the Word, who in his love for mankind descended into the world's spiritual root. Now in the flesh, he works his salvation in the midst of the earth. That is, he works his salvation in the tomb, the tomb of his Sabbath rest. The day of the Lord is now the day in which the world moves. And time in this day of the Lord is measured not by the movement of sun and moon, but by the movement of God the Word, the uncreated light who illumines all in love for his bride, the human soul. The heavenly bridegroom emptied himself and moved. He came into the world. He became flesh. And he was obedient to the Father even at the point of death on the cross in order to become absolutely one with us. Become one with us in the bridal chamber that the prophet Joel speaks of. The secret chamber of the heart that St. Matthew speaks of. This day of the Lord now at hand is the mystery of great Lent that we are about to enter. This day is the mystery of the blessed Sabbath rest of God. In the tomb, the Lord is refashioning the old Adam from the dust of the ground to which he, the new Adam, returned. From the blood that poured from his rib when his side was pierced, he is bringing forth the new Eve, the church, the Eucharistic mystery of his body and blood, the light of immortality. For listen. We came to Vespers on Wednesday evening and we sang out. 
The springtime of the fast has dawned. The flower of repentance has begun to open. Then on Thursday, from St. Luke, after reading of the Lord's death and burial, we read, It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath, which will be Friday evening, so it's dark. Remember that the sun was darkened. It says the Sabbath was beginning to dawn. Worldly eyes see us about to begin an unnecessarily gloomy seven-week period, and they turn away, preferring the light of the sun. But we who turn to go down with the myrrh-bearing women to the Valley of Judgment in the secret closet of prayer, we are startled, we are shaken, our heart trembles like stony ground about to break open. For in the darkness of the last day, the eyes of our soul see a light that is not the sun, dawning from the Lord's tomb, like a seed sending forth new shoots and breaking through stony ground. Anointed by this light, our soul quivers, seized by a wonder of fear and hope. For we behold the fearful judge himself suffering the injustice of the cross. And it dawns on us that the terrible day of the Lord is the day of our salvation. For the light that dawns is the light of divine forgiveness. As long as it is still today, the great fast opens onto the day of the Lord's judgment as onto the arena of repentance that God gives to us, the arena in which God confers salvation on those who gladly accept the sweat and labor of the ascetic struggle. Hearing this, do not our souls want to enter with haste, for we know that we are in need of mercy. Are we not quickened with hope and longing when we hear our mother, the church, crying to us that, our son, that her son and our God, in his compassion, himself thirsts for our salvation and longs to grant forgiveness to those who seek him with sincerity and serve him with love? The season of the fast, the church tells us, leads to cleansing and deliverance from the passions. Through abstinence, so we hear, the apostles became shining lights upon the earth, shining not with the light of the sun, but with the uncreated light of Christ that has dawned on this the last day. If we are awake at all to the true longing of our heart, do we not want to draw near, to run to the Master, to enter the gateway of the fast, that we too may be clothed with the shining raiment of regeneration, the baptismal robe of light that is Christ himself, who washes away all unrighteousness and illumines all. It is in this Lenten and Paschal hope and joy that I believe we hear the gospel of the Lord's word to us this morning. Forgive, and your Heavenly Father will forgive you. Fast in secret, so that only your Heavenly Father sees it. Let the treasure your heart loves be the treasure that is in heaven. And how could this beloved treasure not be the Heavenly Bridegroom who comes at midnight, who in the injustice of his cross has put to death every injustice, to forgive and to seek forgiveness of those we have wronged for the sake of Christ is to nail ourselves not to our anger over the injustice, but to the victory of the Lord's cross. And we nail ourselves concretely <coughs> to the cross by taking up the fast. <coughs> To forgive as the Lord commands, then, 
doesn't mean that we deny or pretend an injustice didn't happen or that the evil in the world doesn't really matter. Rather, it means that we acknowledge it and we confess the anger that goes with it. But we do not turn and go down into our anger. We turn and we go down with our anger into the Lord's tomb. And we do so with the help of his cross, which he gives to us and which we take up, if we want to, in the form of the fast. It's in the tomb of the Lord, not in our anger, obviously, where our heart is delivered and cleansed of the anger that would enslave us and debilitate us. For the Lord's tomb is empty of every injustice. In his tomb, evil and injustice have ceased to exist. Only beauty, joy, goodness, and life are raised and come forth from the tomb with the heavenly bridegroom. Is all this not to say that being able to ask forgiveness and to forgive from the heart is a gift from God? We can't do it on our own. We can do it only as it is given to us by God. It is a gift. It is a gift from God, given to those who unite themselves to him in the likeness of his death. And how can such a gift be given if we do not seek it? How can we believe we are seeking it if we do not set out to deny ourselves and to take up our cross and follow Christ to his cross and into his tomb by means of the ascetic disciplines that the church is giving to us. These ascetic disciplines that cleanse, that deliver, that make light, that heal and give life. So today we pass through the gateway of the fast. We come into the valley of judgment to discover that we have entered the arena of repentance. Mystically, we are turning to go down into the presence of the fearful judge who thirsts from his judgment seat the cross to grant forgiveness to those who seek him with sincerity and serve him with love. We enter the fast seeking this gift of forgiveness not by talking about it, not in theory, but by actually doing it in a concrete way, in the rite of forgiveness that we follow at the end of Forgiveness Vespers after the coffee hour this morning. I'm thinking that this mutual forgiveness is the armor of light that St. Paul calls us to put on and I'm thinking that this armor of light is another form of the cross that we are called to take up and that this rite of forgiveness is another form of the cross that we are called to take up. And as we do it, this is how we walk, not in theory, but concretely, in real terms. This is how we walk as in the day the day of our salvation that is now at hand. The light of salvation shining from the Lord's tomb on the last day in Great Lent is the gift of divine forgiveness shining on all of us. Any of us can receive it. We need only to turn toward it in repentance and begin to walk in it by going down toward it in the tomb of our heart, which we do by means of the ascetic disciplines of the church. We go down toward it in the tomb of our heart where the fearful judge himself has become one with us, that he may shine the healing and the life-giving light of his forgiveness on us. In this light, do we not behold the supreme theophany? 
And do we not behold the supreme epiphany of what it is to become truly human, raised from the dust in the image and likeness of God? May the Lord have mercy on us. Amen. Most holy Theotokos, save us. Glory to Jesus Christ. Amen.